What child is this? Originally written in a poem titled The Manger Throne, and later set to the music of Green Sleeves. What child is this has become a favorite hymn. And throughout the lyrics of this Christmas carol, that question is posed over and over again. We've looked at the answer as seen through the eyes of shepherds. Because Jesus himself is the good shepherd. We've looked at the answer as seen through the eyes of the wise. Because Jesus himself is the giver of wisdom. And today, we turn toward one who is thirsty. One who is hungry and thirsty for righteousness. And whose thirst was quenched by Almighty God Himself. We turn to a humble young woman who had the best parts of her life still before her. She had plans, she had intentions, she had been pledged to be married, perhaps to the man of her dreams. And then God interrupted her plans. Giving her something to quench her thirst that she could never have imagined. And that's where we pick up today. As we turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 1, I would invite you to stand to your feet for the reading of the word of the Lord. We begin reading today in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high, the Lord God will give him a throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the powerful truth of your word. We thank you that you take note, common and ordinary people, and you see the extraordinary potential that you have placed in each heart and life. And God, you care for the thirsty. You provide for our every need and leave us wanting nothing more. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that for each one who is here today who has come thirsty, that they would be refreshed in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, friends, as we read in Scripture about this child, we learn that This child, called the Son of the Most High, bore the likeness of God. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, we read, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. Sustaining all things by His powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. 
Jesus is the exact likeness of God. But all of us, including mothers, including the mother of Jesus, bear some likeness of God. In fact, the Bible uses maternal language to describe God in several places. We call God our heavenly Father and obviously the Son of God for resemblance to His Father. But I would submit to you that even His physical mother, the one who bore Him and nurtured Him, bore resemblance to God. There are elements of God's nature that are best described in the tendencies and the behaviors of a mother. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 13, we read of God's comfort in motherly terms. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. I may have shared with you on a previous occasion that one of the defining moments in my life as a father came in a a moment when our family had gone to church in southwest Missouri and our kids were participating in a big gathering to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. Oh, they were hunting for eggs with treasures inside and doing crafts. And the church that we attended in southwest Missouri had a large room filled with a play structure like you might see at a restaurant that caters to families with young kids or you might see on a playground. It was inside, so no matter the weather, the kids could play and climb through tubes and tunnels and go down slides and jumps into pits filled with balls that undoubtedly had slobber and saliva and other bodily fluids that had yet to be washed off. Ah, yes, it was a great place for the spreading of disease and germs, but there was fun to be had. And our daughter Abigail, then just a toddler, was having fun when she took a tumble down a tube. And we heard the blood-curdling scream. I say this was a defining moment for me as a father, not because it was the first time I had heard my daughter scream, but it was, to my recollection, the very first time that when she screamed out in pain, She called not for her mother, but for her daddy. Mm, Hallelujah. I have to say that I tried not to gloat in that moment as mommy ran to her, but she stretched out her arms to daddy. Make no mistake, there's a reason that she would usually call for her mom to comfort her in times of pain. But the reality is that every mother receives that quality to bring comfort from their heavenly Father. It makes God no less God that He be described as a mother who comforts her child, for He Himself is Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. The Holy Spirit is not an agent of God, but the Holy Spirit is God Himself co-equal with Father and Son. As a mother comforts her child, so God says, will I comfort you? And you will be comforted over Jerusalem. But God has another quality often attributed to mothers. Many fathers know that it doesn't matter how long ago the indiscretion occurred, what the conflict was about, or how long since you have forgotten, mom will remember. 
God's memory is described in Isaiah 49, 15. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast or have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. No, a mother, a mother will scarcely forget the one she carried, she nurtured, she nursed. And inasmuch as a mother might remember the baby she bore, even after that baby has grown and matured into adulthood, our Heavenly Father remembers even more. He remembers not just our failings and our indiscretions, but He remembers our innocence, our purity, the potential that was in us when that single cell first began to multiply. He remembers all that He saw in us at the moment we were conceived all he hoped and dreamed for us, and every step we took in the right direction, and every time we turned back to him, he remembers. A loving mother does not fixate on the faults and failures of her little ones, but rather focuses on the hope and the potential that everyone bears because they remember that clean slate they held in their arms on the day their child was born. I can remember looking into the eyes of a newborn baby as Ana Yancey lie in a hospital bed recovering and thinking, thinking of the life that awaited this little one and wondering what it must have been like for the mothers of those men and women who had grown and made terrible choices. How they could not love that baby they once held in their arms. It's a great picture of, of God. That he will not forget us no matter where we go or what we do. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? And have no compassion on a child she has born. Friends, if you wonder if God can forgive anything. Oh, in this way, he's like a mother. Just hoping for the opportunity to forgive, to embrace, and to be reconciled with the child that he loves. With you and with me. Which brings us to another quality of God that is revealed in Scripture in maternal terms, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 32, beginning in the latter part of verse 10, of God's protection. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft, the Lord alone led him. That mother eagle who protects her young from those who might be threatened by this future leader that's now in the nest. That mother eagle that will not uh, allow her young to fall from the nest if there's anything she can do about it. God looks to you and to me and protects us and covers over us with his wings. And that protection sometimes leads to an attribute of God that, frankly, we don't often like to discuss. That's also described in biblical passages in terms of maternal instinct. It's that attribute of God's fury. In Hosea chapter 13, the beginning of verse 8, we read, Like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open. Like a mama bear, seeing that her cubs may be threatened, God will step in and destroy the one who desires to kill, steal, and destroy his cubs. 
Don't mess with Mama Bear. How many of you know that truth? How many of you know? And I, this, this goes for men and women. Men, we know out hunting, the most dangerous thing you can approach is a baby bear when you don't see the mama because mama's nearby. And she's protective of those cubs. And men, we know at home that mama bear protects her cubs. One of those cubs comes home with a scratch or a scrape or a black eye. We know to do whatever we can to help minimize the situation before this comes to Mama Bear's attention. Amen? Don't rile Mama Bear. God describes himself like that Mama Bear. Oh, he loves his children. He loves you and me. That's why the word of God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Because God and God alone has the authority to bring justice to those who harm his children. And I believe that in some cases God does in fact exercise that fury against the father of all lies and those who follow his deception because of God's longing. Jesus, the Son of God, co-equal with the Father, compared himself to a mother hen. In Luke chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. Jesus uses maternal language to speak of his love and his longing for those who've turned away. Who've abandoned and rejected not only the Savior of the world, but the prophets and the messengers who've been sent to draw people back to God. And Jesus doesn't look at those who have grieved him, who have stolen from his house, with anger and animosity, but rather as a mother hen who gathers her chicks that have wandered away, gathers them under her wing, still longing for those who may be unwilling to return. I think it's interesting that Jesus, the Son of God, would compare himself to a mother hen when in reality as we look at Scripture, we see that he is not only the exact likeness of our Heavenly Father, but he also bore similarities to his physical mother. Like mother, like son. I don't know that I would go so far as to call Jesus a mama's boy, but he was his mom's boy. And the heavenly father chose her, Mary, to be his mother, knowing that he would bear some resemblance to the mother who bore him. In Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 30, we read, The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Mary found favor with God. God could have chosen anyone throughout the course of human history. Any woman equipped her to raise this child, but there was something about Mary that was so significant that God said, this is the one. This is the one who will have an indelible imprint on the Savior of the world. I believe one attribute of Mary that's evident in Jesus himself is Holy Spirit power. In Luke chapter 1 verse 35 we read this of Mary. The angel answered the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. It wasn't just Mary's doing. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon her. And likewise, we see the power of the Holy Spirit evident in the ministry of Jesus. In Luke chapter 3, verse 21, we're told, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. That Holy Spirit power that was evident as Mary embarked upon the greatest ministry of her life, perhaps of any human being born in the flesh. The ministry of mothering the Savior of the world. That Holy Spirit power that came upon Jesus at the moment of his baptism. As he embarked upon his public ministry. I want to encourage you today that that same Holy Spirit power is available to you and to me as we receive the power of God. To be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the uttermost parts of the earth. As we embark on humble servanthood. Humble servanthood was evident in the life of Mary and her son, Jesus. In Luke chapter 1 verse 38, we read Mary's response at how the incarnation would occur. I I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. I am the Lord's servant. Look at the picture painted of Jesus in Philippians chapter 2. We read beginning at verse 6 of Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Verse 7, rather, he made himself nothing, nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This was Jesus' purpose from the beginning. It's the reason that he came to earth, but throughout the course of his life was modeled for him by his mother Mary, this woman who was hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for the will of God to be accomplished in her life and in her home. It was modeled for him the posture of a humble servant, the posture which he himself would bear. Perhaps some of his words and deeds were influenced by the mother who was chosen by his heavenly father to raise and nurture him. And then an interesting observation, the similarity between mother and son are the angelic encounters that occurred at surrender. Both Mary and Jesus at an angelic encounter at their moment of surrender. In Mary's case, we read in Luke 1.38 that she said, I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her at her moment of surrender. But in Luke 22.41, we read this, that Jesus withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. You see, Mary's angelic encounter concluded at the moment of surrender, and Jesus' angelic encounter began at the moment of surrender. I can only wonder... How often we 
in the words of Scripture, entertain angels unaware. How often God sends a divine messenger to inform, empower, equip you and me when we are willing to surrender. Perhaps at some level in our moments of surrender, if we completely gave in to God, He might remove the veil from our eyes only to see that there is already a great army of angels surrounding us even in this moment. Protecting us not from those who would seek to steal or destroy what is easily replaced, but to kill, steal, and destroy those for whom Jesus has laid down his life. See, I believe that God still empowers the angels of heaven to serve his purposes here on earth. And though we don't often hear and sometimes raise a brow at the suggestion of angelic presence today, I believe that these encounters are much more common than we may choose to believe. To admit. I believe that the angels are coming and going every moment. That a follower of Jesus Christ is willing to surrender to the will of God. Helping us to accomplish his will in our midst. As we turn to this example of mother and son. Can't help but think. The writing of the Apostle Paul that said that we are to be imitators of Christ. Imitators of Christ. That all of these terms used to describe Him might be true of you and me. It's hard to imagine that Mary could see where this journey would ultimately lead, though there were elements that were telegraphed for her. In Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 34, we read of a man of tremendous faith, advanced in years, named Simeon, who seeing Mary and Joseph and this newborn baby coming to be blessed at the temple, recognized the fulfillment of God's promise to him that he would see the Messiah. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. So that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. There's a mixture of blessing and warning in those words. This child will be destined to cause the falling. The falling of tyrants bugs, dictators, those who deceive, and the rising, the rising of the lowly, the poor, the needy, the helpless, the defenseless, the hungry, the thirsty. This child is destined to be a sign that will be spoken against. That 2,000 years later, his name might be used as a profanity, an exclamation of anger and pain. A sign that will be spoken against. And in so doing, the thoughts of many hearts 
will be revealed and the need for this Savior will be made evident. It's the very mention of His name will reveal whether He is revered and received as Savior or shunned and rejected. And then Mary was warned very personally the sword pierce your own soul too for we're told that Mary stood at the foot of the cross and watched as the baby she bore and nursed breathed his last breath dying a criminal's death for you and for me Though these words are seldom sung, they do appear as the second stanza of William Chatterton Dick's original text. What child is this? Nails, spear, shall pierce him through. The cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail the word made flesh, the babe, the son. Friends, I want to encourage you during this joyful season to remember that the birth of Christ is the initiation of the greatest event in human history, the sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin. 